Welcome to another edition of the Dracos Dotte podcast. Today we're focusing on weaving. From the workshop today, looking at tablet weaving, meeting the Viking Volva in Companion Chronicles. My name is Herva and I am a Volva, or as you may know me, a witch. I can cast spells and incantations, and today I'm going to take you back with me over a thousand years, when the lands were very different, but the people were much the same. In Meet the Maker, Jane Delar and her warp-weighted loom. Yes. Um, Then you beat it hard, and the warps disappear. And in Contemplation Corner, how the reenactment family can help your confidence and your mental health. I mean, when I first started, like I said, I was so shy. I was a completely different person. Like, I wouldn't, um, I was very nervous about doing uh, one-on-ones. Yes. Uh, I wouldn't say boo to a goose, really. (laughs) First, an overview of tablet weaving the Dracos way. What's occurring? From the workshop. All right. From the workshop today, a little look at tablet weaving. There are many ways to make braiding and cording that are historically accurate methods to what's been found from Anglo-Saxon Viking ages. I'm going to focus on tablet weaving and brocading. There are ways of looking at a band to identify whether it has been tablet woven, tablet woven and brocaded, or woven using a rigid heddle and so on. Although there is minimal evidence for rigid heddle use during the Viking times, Roman heddles have been found and medieval, but minimal for our time period, so it's hard to speculate. What we can do is look at the tablet woven finds and identify how they were woven depending on how the threads twist together. Tablet weaving is a warp faced pattern, meaning the colours of the threads that make up the long warps will be the colours that show in the final band. Unless we're talking about brocading, which we will be in a minute. So it doesn't really matter what colour you use for your weft thread that goes left and right. I sometimes use the same colour as the border, so it's a hidden weft. Sometimes on a wider belt, I think it's nice to have a contrast and see the weft like little specks along the length of the band, like this example I've woven. Now, in general, the way the tablets are threaded from the front or the back of the tablet, makes the warp threads slant slightly. So most tablet weaving patterns work in diagonals, creating diamonds and crosses. Like this example, I've woven using the pattern from Hallstatt, dating from the Iron Age around the 800 to 400 BC era, This came from what was then a salt mine in now modern day Austria. You can see the way the tablets have been threaded and turned makes this diamond pattern. So when you see tablet weaving that has lines that are parallel or perpendicular to the edges of the band, it's probably brocaded, like these examples from Berke in Viking Age Sweden. So brocading can use an extra weft thread to create these straight patterned lines. Also, many examples of brocading use gold and silver threads, like the Taplow Anglo-Saxon burial from 7th century in modern Buckinghamshire. Tablet weaving is also used as a border on a warp weighted loom. So both a way to bind the edges together to stop them fraying 
and also just to look really nice. Much like today, you want to show your status off in the clothes you wear, so why not add a beautiful bit of tablet weaving to it? There are so many bands and I am learning all the time. Every once in a while, I have a small victory about being able to weave a new pattern. Whoop, whoop. Here are some of the patterns I can weave in a chronological order. We have one of the Hallstatt from the Iron Age in Austria. A simple Snartimo band from 6th century Norway. A Kaupang band from 9th century Norway. And the classic Osberg from 9th century Norway. If you follow Bainte Skoggas on her Facebook pages, Osberg Tablet Weave and Osberg Tablet Weaving Group, she has fully researched and examined these textile finds under a microscope to see how they are woven together and instructions on how to weave the bands, including this 14L classic, are in books that she's published. She's written a thesis on one of the textile finds in particular, the 34D band. I can only hope that one day I'll be able to weave this one. Then, dating from late Anglo-Saxon times, there's the Cambridge Diamonds Band. Found as the strap end on a belt and detailed on Sheila Lewins's website. Sheila Lewins is a great starting website if you want to look at historical patterns and also how to tablet weave to start with. Sheila also runs Twisted Threads tablet weaving page where you can donate to her running costs and create your own designs with her amazing software. Awesome. Then we move on to burka designs. So these were originally brocaded and I've done tablet weaving interpretations of these finds. B2. B6. Oh, that one is a real headache. B12. And all the Bs mix into this belt, B6, B14 and B22. And I just love this dragon head design. Talking of dragons, there's also the Dublin dragons from 10th century. I'm very envious of people who can do this quickly. It literally took me days to do a couple of metres. So I want to practice a bit more. And then a recent conquest for myself, 10th century Mammon from Denmark. There are several designs, including some silk sleeve cuffs. So how does tablet weaving fit into your outfit? Well, you have tablet woven belt, tablet woven headbands, tablet weaving to make garters to hold leg wraps up, for example and also tablet weaving as part of an outfit. Now I have two small examples here. One, an example of the Skolderham grey find, where we have weaving around the collar and cuffs and even around the ankles of trouser fragments. Also this new exciting project from Fashioning the Viking Age, where finds have been examined in minute detail counting threads before you even start to make an outfit from it. And this image shows a textile fragment, Ivalioch, with tablet woven bands and fur used in its decoration. So the only real way to check how you can use tablet weaving is to complete your own research and check with your group. But it does make your outfit look really pretty. So my ambitions for braid weaving future are to delve into brocading, more Anglo-Saxon bands, more rust bands, Icelandic tablet weaving as well. It will keep me out of trouble for a little while at least. If you'd like to start tablet weaving, I'm working on some kits with naturally dyed wool and linen which will be available at Evesham Medieval Market in May. If you want to follow an online tutorial, I 
would highly recommend Weave Along with Eloise on YouTube. Links provided. My name is Herva and I am a Volva, or as you may know me, a witch. I can cast spells and incantations and today I'm going to take you back with me over a thousand years when the lands were very different but the people were much the same. That was fantastic and of course that was the very loud tones of the awesome Jerry. Hi Jerry! Hello! I'll try and be a little bit quieter. <laughs> <laughs> So your role as Volva, Jerry, in your group, what does that mean? My portrayal that I'm working towards is fear cat burial that is thought to be a Volva. Um, it, it can mean a great many things. Uh, in our group, um, uh, I think I'm affectionately known as group mum. <laughs> uh, but yes. it can mean that the Volva is a a strange term which relates to these women in the Viking times who were basically a seer s prophetess. We would call them, I mean, they were later surrounded in medieval times, maybe as being witches or hags or crones or anything like that. All those words come from nice things, but were made mean later on. So the role is one of divination, maybe magic. Yep. And yep. would you advise the Jarl? How does it work? There is uh, the Sadia magic, which is uh, very much uh, a divination, like you say, looking looking forward. So the, the Jarl in this particular instance would look to Herva to look at the likelihood of battles coming out victorious or, you know, things like that. So there's, there's lots of different ways that uh, a Volva may be of use, but they're usually on their own, wandering about maybe a few girls or, or young women with them, just to help them uh, along with uh, whatever they need help with, basically. Oh, so there's a sense that the Volvo is an older woman in the community, um, kind of the wise woman, and like you say, have the young, pe young women with them. Maybe, is it like an apprentice role they have then as well, training them up to be the next Volvo maybe? Um, I th there's there's hints in some of the literature and some people think that there was this kind of thought of the volure so anything like this is always interpretation anyway but it seems like she would have people with her but didn't necessarily need people with her because wherever she went uh, she would be safe. I'm guessing they were easily recognisable as somebody who is a conduit to the gods or at least a conduit to the future and they would be safe, basically. They, they would um, not be touched walking on a, on a road on their own in the, the sagas. There's suggestions that, you know, Jarls and even kings would actually give up the high seat for the Volva when she came visiting. They'd give her, like, a feather pillow to sit on. In one saga, she gets given a hen feather pillow uh, to, to sit herself on after her arduous journey very nice nice and respectful also I guess is there a hint of it that you don't want to mess with Evolver as well you don't want to get on her bad side oh very 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 much so um even Odin appears to be slightly wary if not a little frightened of the Volva particularly as obviously in the uh, saga uh, with the 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 Volva in it um, when she talks to Odin, she actually predicts Ragnarok. So obviously he's a bit perturbed <laughs> by this. Which saga is it that the Volva appears in? It's Voluspa in the Poetic Edus. There's a description of her in there. Let's, let's see, visualise the Volva. Yes, she's got a blue cloak um, with glass beads and she's got cat fur which some people say, well, is that her link to Freya? Because obviously Freya's uh, pulled along by cat. Or is it sort of uh, disrespectful that she's got the skin of cats inside her, her cuffs and, and, and around her hood and that kind of thing? The vulva was outside of the normal hierarchy of society. 
not only were they wary of her as an entity, but also needed her and wanted her uh, counsel or divination or whatever it is with the Sadio magic. But there's there's these links to an original one, like the Volva who started it all, if you like. She was described as being outside the nine realms. It kind of goes along with the fact that as a Volva, you would be outside the normal society, the normal hierarchical society. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the Volva was more important, but it doesn't not mean that as well. It, it's a different type of power. Being an outsider, it means you're a bit unknown and people not understanding how they were able to divine and predict things. Was it always a woman, Jerry? Well, normally from my readings, yes. Now, there is the suggestion that if a, um, this is where it takes a bit of an, uh, a strange turn by modern standards, um, the Sadia magic was thought of as uh, something that women would do. Now, in, we are, it is thought that in uh, Norse society, um, if a man was to conduct Seder, and there were men that, that did this, but it was thought of as very, uh, well, the word they, they more often use, I believe, is ergi. So they were thought of as basically woman-like in a very masculine society. Oh, right. um, it's interesting because in some of the sagas, Odin himself is supposed to be dabbling in sadio magic there is that suggestion there that odin himself might have been sort of a, a little effeminate and, and the the vulva being so well thought of i guess is another way of putting it they were frightened of her too because of the the, the power and the influence that she had but that as a as a female position i mean you know what are we talking 600 years later lots of women were killed for doing far less um in in the witch trials and things like that in in the 1600s um, and earlier and slightly later but it's it's a, a time period where women were empowered very much so by the standards of later medieval men and women it was really interesting, actually, something I found out that there were these um, in Germanic tribes in like something like 400 and something BC. There were these women, these groups of women that they would call mothers, um, but they were thought of as this cunning woman. It's um, I found that really interesting. because I was like, oh, wow, this goes way further back than I ever thought. The vulva was usually unmarried. Although it was very interesting because the thing that I was reading about that is the Volva was unmarried and then very, very quickly afterwards it says, but not celibate. <laughs> so goodness knows what she was up to. <laughs> the original Volva, if you like, I've heard it termed as the cosmic Volva, which just sounds, sounds fabulous. Um, sh uh, she is apparently so old that she can remember a time when, uh, 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 well, pre-time, um, when before there were giants, so before there was Emir uh, in, in Ganungagap, and when Idrisil was just a seed. Oh, that's So she's really, really old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a very different structure to society, and it's really difficult to explain how she interacts within that hierarchical society because she just isn't. She's just on her own, a, a whole kind of uh, lonely existence, but everyone kind of either wants her to do something or doesn't and is quite frightened at the same time. So would the villagers have looked out for her in that sense of um, nowadays we have um, in Buddhist monasteries, people give offerings of food to the monks. And um, so there's a sense that as you give your offering to the monks, you they will pray for you and help you and your family with their intentions and, and their prayers yeah. so is the same with the vulva uh, yeah i i think so because in one of the sagas basically there is a um when odin meets her 
um, and, and she sort of foretells basically all this terrible stuff for him. Um, he pays her with a necklace and a ring. So he is paying for his prophecy, even though it's not necessarily a very good one for him. But I, I would assume that that would, uh, again, it's all interpretation anyway. Um, but from, from my reading, I would assume that that's something that she would do and, and she would be bestowed gifts and loveliness and all that sort of thing. Because I guess people would be like, if I give her loads of stuff, then yes. I'm in on, you know, that, that, that just makes sense, personally. But, oh God, I really like so-and-so, the blacksmith's son. I wonder if she can put in a good, like, little something for me. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, there's trance magic and that the, um, either herself or her um, followers, apprentices, whatever you want to call them, um, the, the, the girls and young women, were, um, would kind of help her to get into this trance-like state with sailor magic and all that kind of thing there is um a suggestion of her sitting on a high seat and there's a little chair been found in what's considered vulva burials um and she'd sit on a high seat probably on a hen feather pillow um and she would do this incantation and and that kind of thing and stamp her staff on the on the boards and and make a big show of it and there is actually the suggestion in some of the things i found it really interesting there's some of it that says the reason that she's making a big show is so that it seems more impressive. It's not that it's pretend, but it's a show to the people around her. And actually it's a show to the gods as well. So they take it, so they'll take notice. Um, and there's a specific song that was sung. The the whole ceremony of it and the 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 bringing everyone together to to see it. It's not like, uh, you know, you see in Vikings where they're all covering each other in blood and they've all got, you know, all, all that kind of thing. I mean, there's some suggestion that in the uh, Fear Cat burial, there is a little tiny pot that used to be one of the brooches, a box brooch, and has been turned into a pot. And it's got lead based white paint in it. Now, again, all interpretation as to what that was used for, but some people think that that would be used um, as maybe a face paint, maybe a uh, face paint for the person who you are um, do doing the seeing for and, and stuff like that. But obviously there's quite a lot of interpretation. Yeah, absolutely. And coming back to the sort of ceremony of it, talking to Becky about um, witchcraft and spell work and modern witches, is there is a sense that you don't need any of that to no. manifest and have your intentions but it's that occasion isn't it and getting into that mindset and um using the right colored candle and smelling incense will put you in that zone so like you did you call it trance state she goes into did she use um, yeah. herbs and stuff was it all that kind of trance well it's ever so interesting that you should mention that <laughs> because um in a couple of um, what are considered to be vulva burials. Although obviously they're not buried with a little name tag that says, hello, I'm a vulva. You know, the, it, it, again, all interpretation and people interpret these things differently. But there isn't much interpretation when cannabis seeds are found. Um, she's got a little pouch of cannabis seeds, a little pouch of henbane seeds, um, which is deadly poisonous if ingested in the wrong quantities and manner but there is a suggestion that if you throw it onto the fire it will um, release a smoke that is mildly hallucinogenic um, you can make it into a salve to put on the outside of yourself um, if you are suffering from any kind of ailment where that might help I would imagine there was some uh, should we say chemical assistance in some of these ceremonies maybe yes i mean humans they dabble don't they some well, yeah. the vulva the suggestion is that it means wand wed or a staff carrier or or something like that so you would have a staff but they have been found with these um these metal staffs and it, it's it's really interesting because when these graves were first uncovered the 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 male um archaeologists who are uncovering these graves were very like oh it's it's a lady it must have been a cooking spit um or or a or a spinning whirl or you know that kind of thing and now as the interpretation 
gather speed and changes over time as it always does they are now thinking that actually these could have been the ones that were spoken of or the staffs or whatever you want to call them and they were often buried with them it's been awesome it's been so so good so thank you so much Jerry. no worries at all see you in a field sometime soon (laughs) hopefully (laughs) meet the makers I'm joined on Meet the Maker today by Jane Delar from Vic Stotter Loom. Good morning, Jane. Nice to talk to you. Good morning, Jenny. I think we first met actually at West Stowe, didn't we? I was then going to say West Stowe. Yes, and then obviously we have a joint love of textiles and weaving. Yep. And they've got a lovely warp-weighted loom at West Stowe. Yes, they have. They've got actually about three I think three or four actually I already had my um warp weighted loom by that point so the loom is a copy of the one they found parts of and knew about at Coppergate oh fantastic so what happens with the top beam is where you would normally roll on oh, as yes. you weave the bottom and get lower and lower obviously it's got to be yes. rolled up so you get rolled up on there and I had a moment, I said, right, I wanted to do, this is getting onto the Varafelder. I wanted to do the Varafelder and I had a diamond twill on it at the time. Yeah. So I discovered, which I think they must have done this. I rolled up, we took off, off, took the weights off the bottom. Yes. Rolled it up and then basically lashed it like you would do a sail, you know, on a boat. Yes. Yes. And then stuck it in, you know, in a linen bag to keep for another time, which I did um, 18 months later, stuck it back up there. I stuck the weights back on and away we went again. A lot of the time um, they they would have had to have made some sail material. It was, was like a tax. So if they were obviously weaving their dress or you know some material for whatever bedding or whatever they're doing and then the hubby came along and said oh hang on we've got to do our four L's by you know whatever yes. to do it then you know she's got oh, crikey I better take this off then and start putting that on oh gosh so yeah. they probably stored it somewhere and mm. went back to it afterwards it's a superb idea and I must admit I do the same on the smaller scale with my tablets where I think I'll do this little bit for stock and then an order might come in and I'll think, oh, it'll take me however long hours to do the rest of this bit for stock or I can just blast this order out and actually get paid. So, yeah, so we do the same thing. Yes. Wrap my tablets yes. up and pop them back on yes. when, when I want to. Jane, would you talk us through the elements of a warp weighted loom, please? Yes, certainly. I'm going to describe mine, um, which is exactly the same as all the others. But for one difference is mine is set up so it's totally self um, standing. Normally they would be leaning. So what we've got is two great big supports about six foot in length on each side. And then it's got a little fork at the top of, um, of, one, of each of those beams. And across the, that goes the top beam where the fork hangs. And then on the fronts of the support are what we call the heddle support bars. Now these are just slotted in and they stick out at the front and they've also got like a little fork on them. The main thing about it is the beam's got to sit in the middle of your A-frame so that when it hangs down, when it's got the um, weights on it, it just hangs down straight down the middle and then what you're going to do is when you put your warps on so they're all hanging down and at the bottom of the warps you'll have your weights hanging onto it and so when you've got that you've got to separate them out and this particular case what I've got in mind at the moment you've got one warp at the back one warp at the front and then the front warps when they've got their weights on you're going to lift them over the support beam that you've put across at the bottom so you've now got a lovely little triangle yes which is your shed wonderful so obviously then with weaving you've got to be able to change your shed in other words you've got to be able to bring the back threads through the between the front threads we're now going to put a 
small stick for the heddle bar. So then I, what I do is what they call knit the heddles. Basically pick it out so you've actually wrapped around the back threads. Yes. Round your beam, round your support bar in the front. Yes. And back again and go all the way along till you've got them all. So when you're sorting your back heddles out, it's all in a one. They're not individual loops. No. For, the, for that, sh or the whole shed is joined in through yes. one piece of string to make all those heddles. Oh, yes, it's cool. I didn't know that. So now all you need to do to change the shed is to pull the bar forward. All the heddles will come through with you between the front warps. And then this is where the little forks come into it. Oh, beautiful. And actually, it add infinitum until you have a sail. <laughs> yes. And then you've got variations on a theme from that point with using the um, the loom is I love the sound of the um, the weights clacking. Oh, I bet. She was a clack. Yeah, sound. A clack. <laughs> yes, that's the sound of history. Love it. <laughs> it is. So we've now got our triangle and we put the weft, which is a bit that's going to go horizontally. You put it in what's called a little smile. Ooh. So it's drooped down. Yes. So, because obviously you've got what you have what they call take up. Yes. So you've got exactly the same thing in tablet weaving, I know, but this is just a bigger form of it. So you can imagine you're sort of going in and out, in and out of it. So it's what was a straight line now becomes a lot longer because of the fact it's got to go around each port. And then you change the shed. Now, before you put your weft again, you will need to beat it. Yes. In this is a fun instrument. bit. Some people beat, some people just put their hands in and then just push it upwards into place. I'll be honest, I've discovered over time that I'm actually too heavy a beater. I'm, I, 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 oh, <laughs> I do. I, I beat the thing to death. I've discovered two things. One, it can pull it in rather. And two, it can actually make the... The fabric that you end up with quite coarse it's almost like tense i love the hands-on feeling somebody i'd read about treating it well you get a better weave by treating it a bit more gently than weaving so than beating it now i had made especially a weaving Wonderful. sword it has got a bit of an edge and you need an edge on one side that is thinner so you can get yes, into the shed nicely absolutely they they use metal weaving swords uh, they used wooden weaving swords. They used their hands. Now, you don't have to have it absolutely spot on because most of the time they would have been using wool. And wool, once it's washed, will change again and yeah. meld into each other isn't yeah. it, when it's washed. The main thing you're aiming for is evenness. With the, just the one heddle bar, that would make what you call plain weave or yes. tabby. Tab tabby. And then yep. you can picking out only certain numbers of warps at a time. You can actually quite make quite a few patterns just on plain weave. Your yeah. pattern threads going left to right, your weft is the one that makes the pattern then because your strikes yes. are going horizontally. It should be balanced. Right, yeah. Uh, it, what, what you would call balanced, really. Often they would have another two more heddle bars on here. Now that would give them to be able to do twills. So you've got your diamond twills and you've got your uh, um, herringbone, yes. things like that. So um, I do love a you twill. Know, you t um, well, they talk they, my they language. Quite, yes, they, they're quite heavily into the twills. Yes. Um, at the time so I bought myself all the way it came all the way from Norway this a Ooh. book called the warp weighted loom and in it it's got it because it is practical it's not just historic which is one of the reasons I fantastic yeah how to walk up the loom from beginning and actually even how to make one one of the things on there was how to do diamond twill so it was a diamond twill that they recreated from a piece of fabric that was found in Norway. So I actually recreated it myself. Wonderful, Jane. Well, but that was on three heddle bars for that. Yes. So the other thing they had in there 
was a uh, Varafelder that they also recreated. Mm -hmm. Which I have from... been admiring greatly of yours um, and uh, the progress of it on your Vic Stotter page. Yeah. And it just took my, you know, took my imagination, fired it off. And I thought, yes, this is what I want to do. Massive thank you to Jane Delar. You can find her weaving at Vic Stottier's Loom on Etsy and also follow her latest makes on her Facebook page. We'll hear more from Jane and the Varafelder in a later episode of the podcast. Focusing on cloaks and hoods. Now we literally take a step towards our well-being and mental health this week with Solvi the Ever Chosen. Contemplation Corner I'm now joined by Solvi the Ever Chosen. Goes Hi. also under the normal name of Cat. Hi, Cat. Nice name. to talk to you. And you. And thank you so much for agreeing to have a chat today about reenactment, well. mental health, walking, and just kind of how it can help alleviate those anxieties that we all suffer from from time to time, especially at this kind of time that we're all going through. And we all feel really locked in and trapped. So when did you start reenactment, Kat? When did it first appear I, on the weekends? I started reenactment back in, I think it was April 2017. I joined Woofer. Um, because I was so shy and quiet, I wouldn't ask. Because of my anxiety, I wouldn't oh, ask no. Yeah. So, okay. Oh, so bless you. So, so <laughs> even though you discovered this new hobby that really yeah. gave you confidence, you couldn't get there because of anxiety. Yeah. Oh, Kat. Yeah. So um, they started offering me lift and I never looked back. I mean, when I first started, like I said, I was so shy. I was a completely different person. Like I wouldn't, um, I was very nervous about doing uh, one-on-ones. Yes. Uh, I wouldn't say boo to a goose, really. <laughs> it's quite intense, a one-on-one -on -one as well, isn't it? Because it is. you have yeah. got that sense of theatre in a way, isn't it? People yeah. watching you. But I guess yeah. what helps, does it help? reenactment because in a way you're not yourself you're solvi the ever chosen did that help yeah. it does it does it really does I mean it took me a while to work out a name for myself um yeah. I remember sitting there each night looking through like Norse baby names yes I've done all <laughs> yeah I've done that saying, yeah. does that sound like me yeah. no <laughs> yeah. this one sound like me and then eventually um solvi just stuck yeah. Um, and then it was at Sheringham, my first uh, Sheringham, I think that was in 2018, that we did a member of public's choice. Yes. And um, I got chosen like three times to do single combat. Oh, fantastic. The name Ever Chosen was born. Oh, and great. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I'm at that show was my, I think on my third show, and it was my first proper gladiatorial, and it was so nerve wracking. Yes, but I come away from it, and I was like, yeah, I found my, I found myself. You found yourself, Kat. I love it. When you're doing the one on one, and it is in front of loads of people, what is it that gets you through? How do you put your anxiety to the side? When you've got to do something like that um i look at everyone on the field and i look toward like the people standing either side of me yeah and i go they are my safety net yeah they're in this with me and when i go out on a one-on-one -on -one, it's it's so strange like i don't pay attention to the crowd yes um, obviously I will well I try I still have issues where I'm like how do I engage with the, with the with the crowd but I'll just focus on the fighter in front of me and go that's who I'm fighting that is yeah. anxiety yeah. that is my anxiety I'm gonna face it and it's um it's so strange how your mind 
kind of forget, well, not forget, but like you're very aware of the people around you. Yes. But you kind of hone in and focus on what's in front of you. If I feel like I've got an anxiety uh, attack coming, I'll just like be like, no, it's fine. You've got your friends and everyone. We've got each other's backs. It's a very tight knit family unit. And that's what I think, you know, we're all missing out on at this time is is being with that family. And what people who mm-hmm. people who look at reenactment from the outside of any era yeah. um, might look at it as something that you just dress up and hit each other a little bit of the weekend and then eat something nice. I mean, that is <laughs> obviously a massive part of it. <laughs> but yeah. But it's all the um, the meeting once or maybe twice a week to train, to talk about things, to talk about the the, the daily life things that you might be struggling yeah. with as life goes on. So that when you come to a show, you've got that history with those people who, yeah. like you say, have got your back in so many ways. And it's not just um, in a battle situation. They've got your back mm-hmm. in supporting you through... Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. Life is definitely definitely um, i mean without i mean i'm in reenactment i've made so many lifelong friends um they've probably been the strongest friendship i've made yeah because uh, like you go like you've just said you go through so many things together and you're basically you've got to have that certain level of trust with them because you're hitting yeah. them with lots of money. <laughs> yes at the end of the day you know you've got to kind of trust each other and um really get to know each other so you know each other's boundaries and limits I don't know I think I would be a much different person if I didn't join Wufa. yeah so <laughs> let's talk about the um exercise side of it as well then so during lockdown we've not been able to train and see our reenactment family but you found other ways to focus your yeah, energy yeah. and to help combat your anxieties what yeah, have you been yeah. up to well, um, to begin with, I was kind of dreading it because I was like, well, hang on a minute, reenactment and training is my outlet. Yeah. It was my highlight of my week. And I was like, what am I going to do now? So to begin with, it started out as, right, I'm going to attack the garden. I'm going to uh, pull a fence down. I'm going to do, you know, make the garden look nice. And when that was near enough done, I was like, right now, what can I do? So that's when I started, like, not hoarding kit, but, like, (laughs) bulk buying kit. (laughs) Yes. A lot of people have been reflecting on their character and kit. Yeah. I mean, I sat sat down and wrote uh, lists upon lists upon lists of what I wanted and what what would look good, like, colours. And then, of course, I messaged you Ah! and was like, I was like, Jenny, help me! (laughs) (laughs) Um, But no, um, then... When that was finished, I was like, right, okay, let's start by making, I don't know, a table. So I made a table. Oh, cool. Out of um, repurposed uh, pallet wood. Uh, Then I made a weapons rack. And then the winter months crept up and I was like, I need something else to do. And I went, I hit a really dark patch. And then it was David who reached out and was like well come on let's go for a walk I literally went from doing nothing to a 12k walk that's amazing (laughs) and about about 2k in my hip gave out oh no um because I've got heightened mobility syndrome um my hip just it is a really weird like cramp pain in my hip and I was like that's that's fine I can deal with this I'll push through it kept going and about halfway around I was like okay this pain's getting worse oh no and um I was like I'm not gonna stop I'm gonna keep going I think I got to the 10k mark and I was like I may have to get a lift home now because I can't use my leg properly (laughs) oh no so that was the start of it really but I think the longest walk we've done is now 14k awesome (laughs) how long does that take you guys I've got you got a big old march on now haven't you we try and pace ourselves we don't like we just go for a nice leisurely walk and yes. we get the heart rate going but it takes us about it's about two hours it's just good. under two hours yeah yeah pretty really good it's it's helped with my uh, mental health so much as well um it's kind of been not a replacement for reenactment but it's been the, an outlet 
Yes, because your walks are not are in the countryside. They're not oh, around yeah. a village or around a town. You're no. pacing footpaths and byways yeah. and yeah. Um, routes that could could have potentially been old walkways. Yeah. Hundreds yeah. of years. There's a lot of old walkways through Norfolk and Suffolk. There is, and there's the similarity with the reenactment. Then isn't there? Were you being yeah. outside? David yeah. is from your reenactment family as well. He is. He is. Bless him. Um, yeah, and and he um he and you can ha so you can talk about the reenactment stuff while you're outside in a in yeah. the comfort of what might be a reenactment setting. Yeah, I mean, we did a walk. Um, uh, we went to uh, is it Case St Edmunds? Yes, and, with the Roman um, ruins. Yeah, yeah. And we went along there and it was so nice. Like I took pictures of the old uh, Roman fort. Yes. Um, I think we're going to go back there because there's bits that we couldn't do because it was so muddy. Fascinating fact about Caestus and Edmund. You'll like this. Go on then. Someone told me. So um, when they did some excavations there, they mm -hmm. found a tiny lead scroll in the river. And it was like a curse that someone had written on, rolled it up, and thrown it in the river for the river god or whoever to take and curse this person. Really? Said, said I cursed the man who stole my trousers. Oh yeah, that was on that was on the um, uh, information boards. That there one. you go. That yeah, was, so, yeah, I remember that now. But you can say, I can understand that. I'd be annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if they're your only pair. I love it around that. It was the first time I went there, and the atmosphere there was just amazing because you yeah. you stand on this old, really old bloody roman fort yeah and um just look out and you can just picture where how it would have looked back then and then we went round Boudicca's way yes. Boudicca's walk. we found out that there's a uh an anglo-saxon cemetery nearby i think next time we're going to try and incorporate that bit as well so lots of people have found lockdown really hard for contact with yeah. people if you if you're if you're finding it difficult to go out on your own Yes. Nine times out of ten, though, when I'm with Fred Bear, I'll just talk to him. Makes me sound like a nutter, but... <laughs> okay. but um, if I'm on my own, I'll take my headphones and listen to them. So I shut out yeah. the outside world and I'm just focusing on my walk. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, even if you go out for a walk and you've got your friend on, on the phone... Oh, that's um, true, yeah. FaceTime them and just go yeah. for a walk so you've got someone there to talk to. Yeah. <clears throat> type thing. Um, and um, being outside in nature as well, it does have healing properties. It just does. Oh, 100%. Um, I think I read somewhere recently that even just 10 minutes in nature raises your endorphins, slows your yeah. heart rate. And all, not if you're walking, stomping along, obviously, like you guys are. Yeah. But yeah, just having those different sounds around you. Like you say, it's, there's definitely healing in it. Uh, it's just so relaxing to go out, listen to the birds, the the wind rustling for the trees, mm. and just and just mm. breathing in fresh air as well. And you just well, mine want my mind wanders back to how like how would they have lived back then? Mm. You know, on a nice day like this, or on a rainy day like this, how would they have kept warm? And I have such a laugh on our walks. It's just so yes. nice to be out and about. Yes, and and like you say that that kind of. Um, bravado that you show when you're being a viking because having done shows on the cliff top in Sheringham in the snow um and freezing sideways rain there's not a lot really that can put you off things is there no, no definitely, definitely not i mean Sheringham is probably and even um uh the viking festival uh, oh, yes. Bar. in october yeah. mud we had the last one we did <laughs> Yes. You know, you, if, you, if you can walk on that, you can pretty much walk on anything. Um, yeah. Keep your balance. That's, that's a workout in itself, is trying to stay upright in mud. So one of the nice aspects about your walks is, like you say, having someone to talk to about things. So whether it's um, someone physically there in a, in a safe way or someone on the phone or a dog. Or a dog. Um, or having a, just so to get out and just have that different headspace and to get away. You must have noticed as well... Um, the season's changing. The daffodils are out, but it was such a different, like, Saturday was really windy where we were, and I had my jumper on and a hat. But yesterday I was out in a T-shirt. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. It's mad. It's that time of year where the weather's like, am I going to be raining today? Now it's be yeah. sunny. Yeah. 
And but with that, bringing that warmth back as well, it just makes you feel better being outside and being comfortable and not cold. And I'm noticing it in the workshop because I've got to, I, I sit still a lot of the time. To be able to be warm is very important. Yeah. It is. It's so much nicer to be out and about when it's warmer. <laughs> so but even in the cold, if you, if you wrap up warm enough, you're all right. Yes. And you make your own warmth, don't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, you do. So have you got any um, top tips, Kat, for anyone who wants to start looking after their mental health a bit better? If you want to start going for walks to improve mental health, definitely, definitely invest in some good walking boots. Right. Good advice. <laughs> you ever, like, um, you, you want to go out, and you, you find that your brain is really giving you reasons not to go out. Just just find a way to, I know it's really hard, but you have to dig deep and twitch that little that little voice in your head right yeah. down so you can hear yeah. it and just go. Yes. And just keep going. You know, you have to have this destination, no routes planned. Like, we, we don't have routes planned. We never know what route we're going to go on until we get there. And just don't. Don't put too much pressure on yourself either. Yeah. Just, just, do it. just go and do it. And you will not regret it. Thanks, Kat. <laughs> That's a really nice right. positive note to end on. Thanks for that. So right, um, yeah. look forward to seeing your next walking exploits on your yeah. That'll be this weekend. And hopefully out with the reenactment family sometime this year would be good, wouldn't it? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> And, and to hug people again. Oh, what's that? I forget. Well, we, we, I mean, we have our animals, so we're not... We can have our animals, yeah. We can hug our animals. I think the dogs yep. are happier to be hugged than cats, though, because, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If I did it to, one of my, to the eldest cat, she'd probably uh, bite my face off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we're hopefully with the return of the warmth and the sunny days and things to look forward to. Definitely, definitely. Thanks, Kat. I think that might, um, yeah, touch on a few things for some people about yeah. that kind of stuff. So I really appreciate that. No worries. Yeah. Nice no one, worries. mate. In next week's episode, I focus on natural dyeing from the workshop. And in Compelling Chronicles, the first reenactment to take place this year is a rather salty fight for the homeless. You know, to make it not just about fun and games and, uh, you know, just two guys slapping each other for fun, we'd make a positive outcome out of it. So we are raising money for these homeless charities. And in Meet the Makers this week, I talk with Kat from Medieval Colours about natural dyeing in the Dark Ages. Let's take pink. Uh, nowadays, we think that it's sort of um, colorful girls. Uh, in the early medieval, it was a symbol of a high status because you uh, needed to take a um, Polish koszenier or a kermes, so some sort of bags. You needed plenty of them to, got, uh, to have intense color. And in Contemplation Corner today, I talk with Laura about neuro-linguistic programming. They once did a lovely piece of research on people who won the lottery to find out if they were happier after they'd won the lottery. Yeah. They're pretty much the same happy. They're just happy and rich. They were happy and poor. You've been listening to a Dracos.ir podcast for entertainment purposes. A massive thank you to all my guests today. All music for the podcast series provided by the amazing Dark Bardess. Find her on YouTube. Thank you for listening and I look forward to your company next time. Silk and fair, fair.